Hi friends, Kenny and the Dragon, Chapter 11. Rolling out a purple carpet. The first part of the boys' plan was keeping the spectators off the hill, and it wasn't going to be easy. As Kenny and his father approached the anxious gathering, they realized that the group was looking to stake out prime seats for tomorrow's battle. There were so many townsfolk present, they seemed like they were everywhere, illuminating the entire hillside with their lanterns and torches, which means lighting up the whole hillside. Kenny stopped just short of the crowd. I, I don't know if this is going to work. His father knelt down, put his hand on the boy's shoulder and looked his son in the eyes. Don't you worry, Kit, he said. If there is one thing I know how to do, it's herding sheep. He held up his lantern and addressed the crowd. Ho oh, there, what's this all about? We're here to see the dragon slaying tomorrow, someone shouted out. Ain't no devil dragon on my land, Kenny's father replied, pulling up a stalk of grass and putting it in his mouth. So y'all best head on. You're dead wrong, Farmer Rabbit, a gruff voice said. The crowd parted and a burly fellow, Porky's father, stepped up. Old Pops Possum seen him here the other day, drinking in the creek. Old Pops told me he pulled a catfish out of that creek the size of my prized you. If you ask me, I think he's the one drinking at the creek, he replied. The crowd laughed. Porky's father did not. Well, your boy said he's seen this thing before, told all the kids in school about it, he pointed to Kenny. What do you say to that? Kenny's father turned and looked toward his son. Kenneth, what's this all about? You know something about dragons that you ain't telling me? This was Kenny's cue, his signal. Yes, sir, I was reading that King's Royal Bestiary all about the monsters. It said that though dragons are cold-blooded, they usually hunt at night. It also mentioned that they are often attracted to a bright light, like a moth an enormous, flying, bloodthirsty, fire-breathing moth. That did it. The crowd began murmuring amongst themselves. Best to stay in tonight, he heard one fellow say. It's getting late, he heard another one add. Perhaps we should douse these lanterns, someone said from the back of the group. Kenny's father eyed Porky's prickly dad for some time, calmly chewing on his grass stalk. Finally, the rabble rouser broke the stair and announced, All right, let's head back to town. He put his hand on his son's shoulder and both turned to go. We'll meet up here tomorrow at dawn. And then, he looked back at Kenny, Ain't nobody going to stop us from seeing this showdown. Kenny exhaled <sighs> as he and his father turned back toward the farm. You see, son, his dad said, putting his arm around Kenny's shoulders, There's always a pecking order. You find out who the leader is, spook him into going where you want him to, and the rest of the flock will follow. Kenny looked up at his dad as they walked back home. In the warm lantern light, he seemed wise now, like Arthur's Merlin. And Kenny realized that his father's wisdom was gained from real experiences and not something that he had read about in a book. They both returned to a very busy household. Everyone was running around, including Charlotte, who had received word from George and arrived to help. Kenny smiled at her as she looked up from her sewing machine. Hiya, Kenny. Heard about your plan, she said. This is going to be awesome. The boy felt his cheeks go warm and looked down at his feet. I'd better check on Graham, he said, and he went out to the barn. The dragon was sitting with George, viewing the map of the hill by candlelight. They two were engaged in a very animated conversation and Kenny's tin soldiers, building blocks, and a toy dinosaur were scattered about on the faded scroll. It was a, this is them sitting there. It was agreed that Graham should say, stay in the barn until midnight so that no curious townsfolk would spy him. Secrecy was of the utmost importance and they had one night only to prepare for tomorrow's big event. A cool, foggy mist topped Shepherd's Hill just before daybreak on the morning of the big battle. 
as the sun slowly rose in the pinkish sky, it burned away the fog just as the first spectators arrived. Porky's dad, of course, was leading the group, followed by Old Pop's possum. Holy smokes, Old Pop said with a whistle. Something done happened to the landscape. That dragon's changed it all up. And he was right, for the hilltop had been miraculously transformed or changed. The enormous rocks from the side of the hill had all been moved, arranged on the grassy meadow to form the seats of an amphitheater. The seating, surrounded by an outdoor arena, with the dragon's cave rising up from the center. A faint smell of smoke was in the air, and Porky's dad was sure if it was coming from the cave, wasn't sure if it was coming from the cave, but he could not see inside. So now I'm picturing um, like a big, the dragon's cave, and then these big boulders, these big rocks arranged all around the dragon's cave, kind of like a stage. For you see, now there were large, richly woven, tattered tapestries covering the entrance to Graham's lair. The enormous oaks and willow trees that flanked the sides were covered with a variety of lanterns and lights, which hung from nearly every bough and branch. The dragon's up, old upright piano, freshly painted in gold and black lac lacquer, lacquer was nestled underneath a willow covered in half-melted candles. By lunchtime, the area was filling up at a quicker pace. Vendors had arrived and were selling all sorts of food and ale. Others sold tunics, toys, and pennants, just like the ones Kenny had seen in town. Children ran around the stony seats and grassy aisles, playing knights and dragons, more than once, Kenny overheard wagers being made on who would come out victorious, who would win. Late afternoon brought a surprise no one in town had expected. By now, most everyone from Roundbrook was present, and clearly word had spread to the neighboring villages, for there were far more sightseers than there were even seats, leaving some to find viewing elsewhere. All of the townspeople and townspeople from the other town were all curious about the large stately procession that was coming from the east road and heading straight up the hill. One vendor standing on top of his cart used his opera glasses to get a be better look and cried, the king, the king is coming. A large group of onlookers rushed over to get a better view. Sure enough, it was the king himself arriving in a beautifully ornate horse-drawn drawn carriage. And ornate means like fancy, very fancy, very fancy decoration. Armed soldiers who looked like younger versions of George marched both in front of and behind him. They stopped at the back of the amphitheater and began constructing a small tower with box seats for his majesty and his courtiers. From a hiding place high in the branches of a tree, Kenny watched the royal servants assemble the tower, finally rolling out a purple carpet for the king to walk upon. The guards flanked both sides of the walkway, preventing any onlookers from getting too close to his majesty. The king was followed by his two sons, a jester and George, dressed in his finest clothing. With all eyes watching, the king, with all eyes watching the king enter the royal box, Kenny hopped down from his hiding spot and scurried back down the hill. This is just like a giant chess game, he thought to himself. Now I just have to move, to move toward a favorable outcome. As the afternoon began to fade into evening, the waiting crowd began to grow restless. The rowdy bunch chanted and stomped their feet in unison. Few of them noticed little Kenny as he lit the lanterns. He knew this was it. It was time to finally set his plan into full motion. Setting alight the last lantern, Kenny looked down at his mother and gave her a nod. She solemnly walked up to the piano, lit the candles, and began playing an ominous melody, which like kind of is like a spooky, sad melody. Immediately, the entire gathering hushed to a breathy silence 
and looked toward the arena. Kenny walked slowly to the center of the battlefield. He looked up in total awe. He had never seen this many people gathered together in his entire life. Strangely, the Riverstone feeling was not present. Instead, he felt a fiery flicker of a feeling, something that cavorted about his insides. This was not a book report. There would be no grade handed to him at the end of this. Either his plan will work or one of his friends might not see the sun set that day. But they all trusted him, his mom, his dad, George, Graham, and even Charlotte. They thought his plan was ingenious, and now it was all up to him. He looked down at his two little paws, took a deep breath, and slowly opened a large leather-bound book. He began to read in a shaky voice. Draco, Latin for dragon, and derived from the Greek word draconta, is the biggest of all living creatures on earth. At this, Murmurs and hushes were heard throughout the audience. Kenny continued, the fiery feeling danced throughout his chest and heart. When the dragon comes out of its cave, it's often carried into the sky, borne into the air, surrounded by blazes, for indeed it is rising up from the lower regions of Hades. Audible gasps could be heard at this point. <gasps> One mother put her paws over her child's ears. The fiery feeling rushed up into Kenny's throat. He continued loud and clear so that nobody could miss a single word he said. A dragon's strength is found within its long and dangerous tail. Tying the tail in a knot will render the foul beast harmless. But be warned, all drakes kill anything they catch with their vicious coils. Kenny slammed the book shut and the crowd jumped back in their seats. He asked aloud with the fiery feeling dancing on his tongue, who among us shall vanquish this menacing scourge from our land? I shall, announced George in a clear voice. Everyone turned toward the royal box and watched him stride down the aisle escorted by beautiful Charlotte. She was draped in elegant, ornate white robes with ribbons and flowers wrapped around her head. The knight was adorned in his golden armor, which had been polished to a mirror-like shine. He held his decorated shield in one hand, Charlotte's arm in the other, and a crimson silken cape billowed and danced about behind them both as they walked toward the battlefield. First, a kiss from a maiden fair, George proclaimed, for this may be my final day upon the battlefield. Charlotte hugged the old man and pecked him on the cheek. Seeing this, the tips of Kenny's ears grew warm. He shook off the feeling and continued. Great knight, not only will you need a courageous heart and a beloved spirit to dispatch this beast, but you will also need magically enchanted weapons. Say now. Have you these instruments of carnage? I do, replied George, displaying his sword and shield for all to see. But alas, he looked down glumly, they are not enchanted. Then they will not work and death will most certainly greet you on the battlefield today, Kenny declared. The audience rumbled with anticipation. Unless, he said in a, I just got an idea tone, Unless there is a wizard, a mage here among us who can enchant your weapons. He gestured toward the crowd. Is there anyone present who can perform such a supernatural task? Heads turned this way and that as the assembly of spectators looked to one another. Porky's dad yelled out, get on with it. But he was immediately hushed. Kenny took in a deep breath as he stood facing the hundreds of onlookers. <clears throat> Come on, he whispered under his breath. Oh, come on, he whispered under his breath. Let's go. And then someone stood up in the back of the gathering near the king's tower and shouted, Ho there! Whispers murmured through the crowd and everyone craned their necks to see who it was. An elderly figure, an old person, wearing a low-brimmed hat and dressed in dark robes, embroidered with strange symbols and stars, leaned on an old pitchfork as he rose. 
I can enchantify your weapons, if that is what you like, he said in a gravelly tone. The crowd parted as the mysterious character hobbled down to join Kenny and his companions at the center of the arena. He walked up to George and announced, Put your sword away. It will do you no good. Instead, use this enchantif enchantificated pitchfork. He rubbed the mud and dirt off of the fork, revealing shimmering golden tines. He held the pitchfork high so that all in the audience could see. Pin the dragon's tail to the ground, he continued, so that you may tie it in a knot and defeat the beast. I think that's Kenny's dad. The wizard then pulled a bottle from his robes and poured the liquid contents onto the knight's shield. This will protect you from the monster's fiery breath. Now, he paused, looking at the audience. Now you're ready. The mass of viewers burst into applause, like clapping, as the old wizard hobbled through back hobbled through them back toward his seat. As they congratulated and patted the mage with cheers of praise, Kenny could feel his heart begin to race. So it is done, he declared, and all the heads turned back to focus on Kenny. Then there is only one thing that remains. There is, George replied in a puzzled tone. You need bait to lure the drake from his smoky den, Kenny answered. The fiery feeling was strong now. It leaped out of his mouth and onto his shoulders. In, is my royal challenge not enough to bring the beast out of hiding? George asked. No, it will not do, answered Kenny. He was controlling not just his fiery anxiety, but the entire crowd as well. He pointed to Charlotte. But she will, the audience gasped. <gasps> Brave knight, there is but one thing a dragon finds irresistible. The sweet taste of a maiden fair. Bind this girl to the tree, and her screams for help will surely lure the beast from his devil den. No, no, some voices in the audience cried, but most were shocked into stupefied silence. George grabbed Charlotte by the wrists and tied her to the gnarled oak, tr oak tree closest to the cave's entrance. At this, the unsettled crowd gasped and moaned, oh, louder than before, but the din could not block out Charlotte's pleas for help as she tried to free herself from her binds, her like she was tied up. Ignoring Charlotte's sobs, George threw off his cape and readied his weapons. Kenny stood at the entrance of the cave, spread out both hands and cried, then let the battle begin.